All right, perfect. Well, I'll slowly get started in case you know anyone else um, is joining, you can also come later. Um, I'm really excited that so many people are here today um, to learn more about AutoVacuum and how we help you optimize it in PGLIS Vacuum Advisor. So to start with, um, we are recording um, the session. We'll also be sharing the recording with you after the webinar. And then if you have questions during the webinar, you can post them into the Q&A section Zoom. You'll get um, both time, you'll have time at the end to answer your questions um, based on those that are in the Q&A section. And then we'll also email any responses that we didn't get to um, in time today. Also, throughout the session today, you'll see Manuel from our team post links into Zoom chat. Um, so those are helpful things that we mentioned as we go through the various aspects of PG Analyze Vacuum Advisor. What we'll talk about today is a couple of things, but this is mainly focused on how the new PG Analyze Vacuum Advisor will help you tune your auto vacuum settings for your production Postgres databases. For context, we launched PG Analyst Vacuum Advisor yesterday, and it's been a lot of work from our team to get this just right and get you a great starting point to start tuning your auto vacuum better. We'll start by talking a little bit about the various vacuum statistics that are available in Postgres today to give you context on what is available and what we're working with here, and kind of talk about what's obvious and what's not obvious. Then we'll talk about the concepts and structure behind the PG Analyst Vacuum Advisor and how it works with that data. Next, we'll talk about bloat estimates and how they can help you tune the dead row threshold. Then we'll talk about how PG Analyst tracks and alerts on the X-Men horizon. This is something that I'm personally really excited about. It's been a very confusing concept um, to me in the past, and I feel like the way we've now kind of described this in PG Analyze and help you alert on this particular problem that can block your vacuums, um, I think really you know, hits the nail, so to say. Um, and so I think you know, this is the best way yet to alert on the X-Men horizon problems that can cause that tuple is not yet removable. Fifth, we'll talk about freezing metrics and anti reference vacuums and how Vacuum Advisor shows you these and how you can essentially take action to prevent transaction wraparound. And then sixth, we'll talk about understanding and tuning auto vacuum performance, for example, by tuning the worker count. And then last, we'll give you a little bit of a preview um, now with the initial release of Vacuum Advisor out, what are the additional features we are looking ahead to. Throughout the webinar today, you'll see a couple of screenshots that kind of show you how the PG Analyst product works. But if you're interested in getting a personal demo, at the very end, we'll also have a survey um, that's sent by Zoom. And so if you, in that survey, tell us that you would like to have a personal demo, I'd be happy to jump on a call and kind of describe to you how the new Vacuum Advisor works and could benefit your company and your databases. Now let's talk about vacuum statistics in Postgres and what are we even working with here? So there's a couple of obvious statistics we use. So if you search for vacuum statistics Postgres, um, you'll find PG step progress vacuum, which I believe was added in Postgres 9.6. So by now you can you know, rely on it reliably. Um, and it mostly tells you if there is a currently running vacuum, how far is that along? And also whether the vacuum is using multiple index phases as well as a couple of other aspects. Um, from this, you can gather how your vacuum performs, but you kind of need to capture it in the moment. There's also peach set activity. So if you're looking to understand how busy is my system with auto vacuum, you can look at backend type auto vacuum worker to understand how many auto vacuum workers are currently running. Um, you can see in the query text which table they're processing. You can also see in the wait event whether the auto vacuum worker is currently in the vacuum delay because of the cost delay um, infrastructure or because it's actively processing data. There is a couple of non obvious things. And our goal with Vacuum Advisor is especially to bring you those things because they are kind of tricky to work with and people have been copy and pasting very long queries um, and writing you know, a lot of scripts essentially to deal with these problems. So the first thing here is the X-Men horizon or what's nowadays called removable cutoff. And so this essentially controls how many dead rows that tuples auto vacuum is allowed to remove. And what's challenging with this is that there is not a single place you can look at. Um, you, you actually do see this in blocks, which we'll get to in a second, but you don't really have a good way of saying in my system right now, what is that cutoff? And so you have to kind of check the different places and kind of make sense of the, those data points. There's also, um, we're talking about freezing and preventing transaction wraparound. Um, there's also, you know, for each table in your database, there's a well frozen XID as well as a minimum multi-axect ID. And those are actually very important because they tell you when an anti wraparound vacuum needs to be launched. But you do need to kind of work a bunch of logic to, you know, essentially deal with transaction epochs correctly. And so, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing where 
just running a simple query is not enough, essentially. Um, if you're ever curious on how we've specifically implemented this, um, the pchannelist collector um, source code is on GitHub. And so you can take a look at um, our collector and kind of see how that is implemented. But then really our goal here is that when enter reference actions are not making progress, then we want to use these you know, rel frozen exity fields to understand that, um, to see how far the frozen exity has advanced. Now, the people that have worked with this you know, auto vacuum problem, so to say, um, for a long time, probably would agree with this, that the best information that you can get is the auto vacuum log events. So this is really the one thing, I, if you take one thing away from this is look at your logs, not just the statistics tables. Um, the good news is that log auto vacuum iteration is now they set to 10 minutes as a default as a Postgres 15. So if you have very long running vacuums, you will essentially always get the logs on your Postgres error logs. The um, default on RDS, for example, on AWS is actually 10 seconds, also in older versions. Um, so thank you to the AWS team for making a reasonable choice here, I would argue. Um, and then I personally would argue that you should be able to run most systems with log auto vacuum in duration zero because it is just one like a set of log lines at the end of each vacuum um, and it's just so useful to understand all the vacuums that have run not just the ones you could sample or that are slow enough now the way this looks is um you know it's very dense in terms of information um density so um it's the kind of thing where you probably want to you know kind of copy this into a file if you're working with it manually and then you do want to kind of like look at all the vacuums for a particular table. Um, this particular example here might be a bit hard to see, but you can see on the lower one, there's a lot more work being done than on the upper one. And so the first auto vacuum had to do almost no work. It also finished very quickly, right? Um, like on less than 0 0.01 seconds. Um, the second auto vacuum had to do by comparison, a lot more work. Um, it still finished relatively quickly in 30 seconds, but it did actually have to read 1.1 gigabytes of data, um, has to write 1.4 gigabytes, and it has also had to write wall um, of 360 megabytes. So clearly, you know, this one has been doing a lot more work. Um, and you can see also how this will help you understand the overhead that that vacuum may produce in your system. Now, in PGLIs, we've actually done this for a while, where we have been showing you for each vacuum that has completed um, a combination of PG step progress vacuum and the um, kind of log output. And so, you know, here's just the next best example I could find in our own database, where you can see this is a much more heavy vacuum, so to say, um, where you get, you know, almost, you know, a, a little bit of an hour runtime. The, like the full table is being read essentially or the similar amount to the full table um, and a lot of writes are happening, right? So this is the kind of vacuum that you want to understand better, want to tune better, have vacuum run more often. And so that's really where Vacuum Advisor comes in. And, you know, as I mentioned, this, we've actually had this for quite a while in PG Analyze. So, um, I mean, this, what I just showed you, that's been there for six years almost. Um, and the good news is that a lot of people found it very useful. Um, and so really what we're doing here is we're learning from what we've done in the past. We're learning from what, you know, customers have told us over the years and what, you know, people still find challenging um, to bring that to PG Analyze Vacuum Advisor. Now, what's new? Well, we launched PG Analyze Vacuum Advisor yesterday, um, and today we'll walk through how it works and the different aspects of auto vacuum tuning that it helps you with. And I also want to give a shout out to Keiko, Machuk, and Jens on our team, who are really the main drivers behind this release. So I'm just here telling you about all the new features. I'm happy to answer any technical questions, but really the credit should go to the three of them for all the hard work they've done. Now, one thing I would mention here is just at a high level, right? What are we doing here? In a sense, what we see PG Analyze do is we want to go from just simple metrics that we're showing you to really helping you understand underlying Postgres processes, right? Postgres is complicated. And so I feel like it's like it's an explanation problem, an understanding problem, a user experience problem, um, much more than it is a just give me a single value to update problem. Now we do want to transform data points into actually meaningful information. Um, as mentioned, X-Men Horizon to me was a puzzle in the past, is much clearer now. Um, and I hope you have a similar realization that it actually makes a lot more sense to you now. Um, and we do want to give you insights for tuning workload specific settings. So workload specific means individual tables that have certain write patterns, certain update patterns, certain delete patterns. We want to give you a very clear kind of insight on them when we have them. And then also we want to give you alerts for critical problems so that if you do need to take action, we can tell you right away. Now let's talk a little bit about how Vacuum Advisor is structured. So first of all, it's a new feature in the PG Analyze UI. So if you are in PG Analyze today, and you have an existing account, you will find Vacuum Advisor on the left menu here. Um, Vacuum Advisor is available on scale and enterprise plans. Um, and you can essentially just have it working automatically once you have the newest collector version. So 
you might have to update your collector to get all the data flowing, but it should already be working in your account otherwise. Now, there are a couple of categories here that I want to talk to, but before I jump into that, let me give you some context on what we do behind the scenes. So if you're not familiar with our general structure, how the PGNLS product works, you have your production database, the PGNLS collector gets data from that production database. Now, in the context of Vacuum Advisor, it gets information like auto vacuum and freezing metrics. It transforms the XIDs to the full 64-bit version so we can track the epochs correctly. Um, it can track column statistics for bloat estimates, and it can also capture your auto vacuum logs, for example, by accessing the RDS APIs to download logs um, if you want to, to go that route and they're available. Now that data gets sent into PGNLS um, through an API. And then what I termed here workload repository is essentially our internal database where we store this. So one essential thing to understand in our design is we don't store anything in your main production database. Um, I generally don't like that pattern where you have a lot of data extra in your main database. Um, and so our general design here and structure here is that we in the PGNLS system essentially save that data. You can also pull it out again with API um, information to kind of get some more context and things. Um, and then what the Vacuum Advisor does is it accesses that data um, in that workload repository to essentially give you insights and recommendations. Now there's three ways to think about Vacuum. First of all, you can think about avoiding bloat by having by vacuuming dead rows early and preventing block vacuums due to the X-Men. So bloat is a very important concept and it's part of the reason why we have vacuum in the first place. Um, second, we want to kind of tune freezing and understand freezing because that's really how Postgres avoids transaction to and multi access to wrap around. Now, you don't necessarily have to do a lot of tuning with freezing all the time, but it is important to understand when you're thinking about how often is my vacuum running and why is it running right now? Like it, it, it has logic, right? It has schedule, but that might not be obvious otherwise. Now, third, you also um, want to you know, think about performance of vacuum, right? So is an individual vacuum run getting enough resources and can you avoid conflicting locks? Now, I'll give you a few examples here before we dive into each of these categories. So think about, for example, Vacuum Advisor telling you you have bloat in your tables and you know that bloat is caused by insufficient vacuum frequency. So your vacuum is not, your auto vacuum is not running often enough. Now that is usually, you know, a recommendation that's not super critical in terms of timing, um, but it does mean that, you know, if you take action, you'll probably avoid bloat in the future, which will make your queries faster and your table smaller. And so, for example, here, the suggested action will be altering a table to set the scale factor or threshold setting, which essentially causes auto vacuum to schedule more frequent vacuums. Another example would be PGLS can alert you to your vacuums being blocked by the X-Men horizon through stale replication slots. This is, you know, like in a sense, the most puzzling and most frustrating experience when you don't know about this and your vacuum just doesn't do anything. And so I think this is going to be really actionable for a lot of people. Um, and so here, you know, I would expect the human to look at this, right? So don't drop things automatically on a database. Um, but here, you know, you could imagine a data platform team member, for example, running a PG drop replication slot that was left by accident from migration. And then last, and this is, I think, really the most urgent thing to take action on, is if for some reason everything fails in regards to freezing, then, you know, your database in worst case will shut down to prevent transaction wraparound. And what we can actually tell you in Vacuum Advisor is which table is the cause, which table is not progressing. Um, and then, for example, you could imagine an on-call engineer going through PG Analyze, understanding what exactly is blocking things um, and taking action like manual vacuums. Um, you know, for example, Drunkade is sometimes a actual improvement um because you if you trunk at a table then you know vacuum is fast essentially um on, only do this of course when you can get the data from elsewhere um and so i think really in this situation our goal is that vacuum advisor can be your main dashboard as you understand that problem and i'll mention one really quick uh like the question i saw fly by so in regards to you know kind of when is this a problem it is with the accent horizon that is really because of stale replication slots that are untouched right so the problem that i've seen usually is that somebody just forgets a you know like open slot on a logical replication publisher um but i'll get more on that in a second now um let's talk about bloat so bloat you know is something that is a fact of life with Postgres. Um, it's unfortunately, you know, kind of the way how Postgres um, works and how Postgres stores data. Um, and I like to think of a bloat as a less than optimal page density. This sounds a bit, you know, um, scientific, scientific -y worded, um, but think about this as a, you have a certain number of rows you're storing in your table, and you have a certain number of pages, each page being eight kilobytes on most systems. Now, what that means is the more, 
pages you have for the same number of rows, the lower your density is, right? So in an, if you look at an individual page, there's going to be less rows in that page. And so oftentimes bloat really is that, right? It's that physical um, kind of structure of a table that's inefficient. Um, and that oftentimes really happens because of how Postgres, you know, kind of performs updates and deletes. Now, there are ways to estimate bloat today. And we've had a lot of discussions about this internally because I'm generally skeptical about these blood estimation queries because they are estimates. But in our research, essentially, what we've determined is that, yes, they're scary and complicated, but th there is a role they fulfill. And really, the job they play is you know, a very simple sense of saying, how many rows do I have? How large are they on average? How are they aligned in you know, the particular kind of um, OS you're using? Um, what's the fill factor on the table? And then you can calculate the optimal size of the table. Biggest issue there, by the way, is toast. So if you have a toasted, um, like a table that stores a lot of data in the toast kind of section of Postgres table, um, there the um, bloat estimates are oftentimes a bit more um, kind of off, essentially. And so really, we've come back to saying, well, you know, these are estimates, but we've actually found them useful. And so we are actually showing you these bloat estimates in PGLIs um, with the Vacuum Advisor. However, we're not running the actual estimation queries. Instead, what we've done is we've looked at the data we're already getting. So for example, column statistics is something we use in Index Advisor. So you know, how large is your text column matters to how expensive is the index because indexes you know, have to actually store the data. And so we already have a lot of these column statistics in PGIS today, um, assuming you've enabled get column stats helper function. So that's the one thing you'll get to notice about if you go to Vacuum Advisor and you have not enabled this yet, um, you'll get the same notice you get in Index Advisor, which tells you to add that get column stats helper. And the good news then is, you know, we don't actually need any additional queries for this. We can just, you know, kind of get the data from what we're already receiving in PGLIs. And there's also no overhead that's added because we have to run more queries essentially to do these estimations. Now, the way this looks like in PGLIs, so Vacuum Advisor has a bloat tab. And in the bloat tab, you can see in the top left, a overall summary of how much estimated table bloat you have on your database. Now, this might be a big and scary number, and I would argue don't necessarily look at the total, but look at the percent, right? So here, this is a large database. And so the bloat being 8% of the total, that's not really a problem. But if you're seeing your estimated, you know, bloat to be multiples of your actual data size, um, that might be something that's worth investigating um, as a whole, right? Um, at the very um, bottom of this um, kind of screenshot here, you can also see that we have the per table bloat information. And so most of the time, I would suggest actually looking at that instead of looking at the overall database bloat. Now, in addition to these overviews, we also have uh, kind of detailed pages for each individual table. And oftentimes when you have vacuum problems, you'll have them on a per table basis. And so here in each table in PGLIS, you can jump into the vacuum analyze activity. And on the top here, you can see the dead rows over time. This really relates to how vacuum is scheduled, right? So vacuum um, on a table will run when it hits that dead row threshold, that red line there. And so what this will help you do at first is understand, you know, is my vacuum running often enough? Um, you'll also see, by the way, that on the screen, of particular here, we'd never reach that right line, right? So you see the gray kind of stepping up, but you don't actually see it hitting that top line. And the reason for that is because here on this table, the um, anti wraparound vacuums to perform freezing are actually running more often than what you could consider an anti bloat vacuum, like a regular vacuum. Um, and so it's really a, a fact of, you know, auto vacuum scheduling. Now at the bottom here, you can see the estimated table bloat. You can also see kind of the imprecision of the bloat estimates, right? So again, these are not precise. Um, there is a, a great uh, kind of function in Postgres called pgstat tuple, which we're not running, but uh, I would recommend you running it um, with care. It is expensive to run because it has to look at the whole table, but it will give you the actual correct number of bloat. Um, this here is just an estimate. And so you can see at the bottom graph where the, um, the red section kind of jumps up and down, that is because the uh, amount of tuples, the amount of rows that are in the table, they're changing when you have an analyze running or vacuum running because Postgres is estimating that itself. And so really, you know, you can see kind of the variability of this bloat estimate, but this table definitely has some bloat and it's had it for a while. Now, if you have a table that newly gains bloat, so that is not yet bloated, but because of out of vacuum scheduling is kind of getting additional bloat, then Vacuum Advisor will actually tell you about this. And the Vacuum Advisor will look at the dead row behavior over time as well as the vacuuming behavior over time. 
and it will, will essentially run a couple of simulations and decide that based on you know this workload pattern with that rows being a function of updates and inserts, um, or sorry, updates and deletes, um, you will actually see it make a recommendation that says run vacuum more often by reducing your scale factor or reducing um, your scale factor zero and using a fixed threshold. Um, and so that's something that will now give you kind of as a recommendation right in PG Analyze um, when we see this pattern. Now, the one thing I will mention here, though, is that we've actually been a little bit conservative on terms of how, you know, kind of this triggers, because one, thing with one feedback we've got with Index Advisor, um, on the Index Advisor side, we actually got a lot of opportunities, a lot of recommendations, and oftentimes it's overwhelming and not necessarily actionable. Um, and so we are working on improving that Index Advisor, but for Vacuum Advisor, we've essentially said, you know, let's let's kind of start with less recommendations. Um, let's give you the ones where we've really seen that new bloat appear on the table, and then we can give you a very clear, very actionable recommendation to change these thresholds. Now, if you are not seeing any of these recommendations, but you still have bloat, then what you might have to do is you might have to actually get the old bloat out of your table in the first place. Um, and so that's something you could do through vacuum full or usually PG Repack, which you can run online, um, which will then, you know, enable Vacuum Advisor to see when the new bloat is occurring before it kind of reaches that um, steady state. All right, so on to my favorite topic, um, how PG Analyze tracks and alerts on the X-Men horizon. So what is the X-Men horizon? So if you're not familiar with this term, um, it had its different names, but if you've either seen the name X-Men or the name Removable Cutoff or, you know, name X-Men Horizon, um, really what this what this talks about is when Vacuum cannot yet clean up data, even though it's deleted. So you issue the delete or you issue an update and the old row version kind of is still on the table and uh, Vacuum comes around, but Vacuum can't actually clean it up. And this might be very surprising to you because you're like, the Vacuum is running, the delete and update have, you know, finished, why Why are they not, you know, kind of vice post is not cleaning up my data. And I'll, you know, just give you one example of somebody writing about this, where somebody said, you know, we couldn't really figure this out, like what Postgres was doing, why it wasn't actually, you know, kind of keeping our tables vacuum properly. And so they, you know, in that particular case, needed some help, they reached out to, you know, the consulting company over in Europe, um, and that consulting company helped them identify what, you know, we hope to give you much more quickly now, um, which is that the issue was that auto vacuum wasn't being run often enough. Um, it was not the issue that it was not being run often enough. It was that it was blocked by something. Um, and in their particular case, it was at least one transaction um, that was blocking auto vacuum cleanup. Um, and for them also, it was really clear when they looked at the logs. Right. So again, auto vacuum log output really makes these things clear, but there is not, you know, there's alternate ways of getting this data as well. Now, if you look at the log outputs, um, the best way to see this is um, if you look at the third line here, which is tuples, um, tuples being row versions, um, you can see that this particular vacuum had zero tuples removed, but had 14,433 um, seen as dead, but not yet removable. So vacuum knew that these rows are dead but it could not remove them yet because of these visibility rules around X-Men Horizon. And what really sucks about this is that Vacuum will run again shortly to try once more. So if you see the same table being vacuumed again and again, then this can be the cause because Vacuum essentially was running. It had to look at the table, but it wasn't able to actually do any um, successful cleanup action. Now, the things that can hold back your um, kind of X-Men Horizon are, for example, long running transactions. Now, what's non-obvious here is that can be any long-running transaction, right? So generally, this is a per-table problem in terms of cleanup, but it is not a per-table problem in terms of what can block it. So even if I just went on your production database right now, and I did a begin, and I issued some kind of thing that actually made it a transaction that, you know, has a full kind of um, reference in the Postgres system, um, like just doing an update on the table, and I don't commit, and I do that for two weeks, like I just let the transaction open, then for two weeks, none of the vacuums on any of your tables will be able to do cleanups for dead rows. Um, so really not obvious, right? You would think that that's local to each table, but it's not. It's a system-wide problem. Um, and so that's why long-running transactions can be such a problem because they are um, causing a lot of issues with a lot of vacuums, essentially. Now, by the way, when we're talking about here, you know, 
like if, if you have a long running transaction for an hour, for example, in most cases, that's not a problem, right? So really, once you start getting to a day long transaction, then I think you should really think about whether that's intentional or not. <laughs> most of the time, it's not. Now, um, another example, and you know, somebody asked about this earlier, also around stale physical replication slots, right? So this is either like could be lagging replication slots, right? So it could just be long replica lags that cause issues, um, but it could also be um, an actual slot that is not being used, but Postgres essentially has to keep that information in the system because somebody might come back and use it. And so, um, because they might want to look at that old row version, essentially. Um, another obscure example are abandoned prepared transactions. So if you're using prepared, um, what well, prepared transactions here, by the way, means, means like two-phase commit type transactions. So it's not, you know, prepared statements, it is prepared transactions. Um, so if you're using them, you probably know, um, but you might be using a system that uses them underneath the hood. Like for example, the Citus extension uses that in some cases. Um, and so that is very critical that you clean those up in time to again, prevent this problem. And then last, um, long running queries and standbys, um, if you have hot standby feedback on, can also hold back the X-Men noise. Now, one thing I'm really happy about is that we have a graph here um, that makes this a lot more clearer to you. So on our own database here, um, this is looking over the last 30 days, so it's looking at a longer time frame. And this essentially shows you that, um, first of all, the top line here is the alert threshold. So that means if we reach six hours, well, and the legend on left being in hours, um, then we'll actually alert you on it. However, um, you know, luckily in this situation, we've not reached that threshold. You can see that we have some long range transactions and they've held back that X-Men horizon for about an hour in some cases, but then, you know, they quickly kind of cleared away again. Now here's a bad situation. Luckily, this was on a staging database. And so, you know, we luckily did not have a big problem because of this, but you could imagine this being a big issue. So here in this particular situation, you can see at the very bottom, long run transactions are still happening, but then for, you know, looks like six days or so, there was a stale logical replication slot that at the very end was open for 196 hours. And that essentially kept vacuum from doing any cleanup for you know 196 hours. So over a week, um, you essentially had um, no cleanup happening on this database because of that stale logical replication slot. And this will directly cause bloat. It will slow down your queries and you'll actually need to then use PG Repack to get the table size down again because tables will bloat when that rows are not cleaned up. So this is very actionable when it happens. And the good news is we can tell you about it. So um, we will actually give you a notification about this. We'll um, show this to you in a pg UI. Um, you can be informed in your Slack, for example, um, get a um, Slack notification in your team's channel um, that will tell you about this problem occurring on your server. Um, and when this happens, by the way, at the very bottom here, you can see, well, first of all, give you which cause it is, right? So which of the four that we mentioned earlier is actually causing the problem, and also how many vacuums were actually blocked um, by this problem in the last 24 hours. Um, so you can get a sense for how urgent um, this problem is. And the one thing that makes this a lot better, I would argue, than any of the existing approaches to this is that it tracks and alerts um, x Horizon based on calendar time. So usually, um, if you're familiar with this problem, usually what the queries that help you monitor this have done is they look at the age of that x -Men. So they say, when was the x assigned? It was assigned 200,000 transactions ago, right? Um, and so if it's you know more than a million transactions, then you know we send an alert. But what's hard to say is, you know, is it actually bad if you have a million transactions that are not cleaned up, right? Like, is that, like, is that a lot? Is that not a lot? Like, did somebody have a spike in activity that maybe caused it? And so it's really, it's not really not that actionable. Versus if I told you, our dead row is not being cleaned up for 24 hours, is that bad? Yeah, that's probably bad, right? And so what we're doing behind the scenes here is we have a mapping between the X-Men values and the actual calendar time values when they were assigned. And so we can actually translate that for you transparently so that you can think about calendar time, not time and transaction IDs. Now, um, let's talk about freezing. So freezing is a fact of life as much as bloat is. Um, and so freezing will cause uh, this kind of essential activity in Postgres that causes anti reprint vacuums to help with that freezing activity. Now in Vacuum Advisor, we show you that under the freezing tab. And in a sense, you know, you hopefully have a way of monitoring this today, but I think what we've done here is we've made it a lot clearer and help you kind of look at not just data points, but also look at it in relation to, you know, which database is holding back um, your transaction ID or like which which database needs more freezing essentially. Um, and you'll also see information like how close you are to certain thresholds 
and we can alert you on this as well. Um, what you can also see here at the top actually is that we can give you certain estimates that are actually very useful to, to understand which type of system you're dealing with. So in the middle, you see the transaction ID allocation, and that's very useful because it tells you how many transaction IDs you're actually assigning. Transaction IDs in Postgres are a finite resource. Um, Postgres unfortunately still has today 32-bit um, transaction IDs, not 64 bits. Um, because of how tables are laid out, it's unfortunately a complex change. Um, the community is working on that, but you know, I would say give it a few more releases. Um, and so this here really becomes the main function of how often you need to freeze. If you assign 100 transaction IDs per minute, you probably don't have to worry much at all about this. But if you're doing like we're doing here, 70,000, or you're doing a lot more, then you might see a lot of freezing behavior in a very short period of time. And so on the left, on the top left side, you can see it on our own database here in um, what Postgres has to do is visit each single table every three days and nine hours. And this is really just a function of Postgres needing to ensure that no table has any old transaction IDs that will essentially become unrecognizable at some point because it kind of um, you know kind of loops around the counter. Um, and so if your system has less than 24 hours, for example, in terms of anti wraparound vacuum frequency, what that means also is that, you know, it, you really need to watch out um, for all kinds of vacuum problems because if freezing doesn't happen, right? Like then worst case, you end up like Sentry, for example, or Manta, like or a couple of, you know, transaction ID wraparound problems over the years that people reported um, that, you know, luckily are much less a problem these days. But this is exactly what you need to be looking at to understand that. Now, um, just a quick, you know, primer. This is from a previous webinar we've done on auto vacuum. So if you want to know a lot more about how auto vacuum works behind the scenes, we've actually done a webinar on that that was, you know, not focused on PGLS product, but just the underlying concepts. Um, and so um, we'll have a link in the chat um, where you can watch the recording of that webinar um, that talks about, you know, a lot of these concepts in more detail. But the quick gist of it is right in terms of understanding which numbers matter here. So there's a couple of settings. So on the top right, you can see vacuum freeze min age. That setting controls whether a vacuum that is running is actually going to mark transaction IDs as frozen. Now, if this was zero, then all the transaction IDs that it was seeing that it could you know, mark as frozen, it would do. It's usually not a good idea because of the added kind of wall um, and such. Um, but the default 50 million, and sometimes people be conservative. Um, vacuum freeze table age means at this point, you know, when does vacuum actually do more aggressive work to do this freezing? And then in, in terms of scheduling, really the top left here, where it's auto vacuum freeze max age, that 200 million default, that really controls how often an enter wraparound vacuum will run. And this needs to complete before we get to that 2 billion mark on the bottom left. So really the biggest issue you have is um, if these operations kind of don't occur in time, then you're getting closer to the 2 billion. And if you're actually very close to 2 billion, like within 4 million of it, Postgres will shut down and force you to do a manual vacuum to perform this freezing. Now, you know, we can kind of watch, for example, here, particular transaction ID, right? Um, and what might happen is, you know, even though, you know, you kind of... Um, had your scheduling right, the vacuum is still running, right? And so what can happen is a worst case, you know, if for some reason your vacuums don't finish, then your database will shut down. So we, we don't want that, right? We want to kind of prevent these problems. Um, and so what we're doing in Vacuum Advisor is we show you a breakdown of the frozen XID age on each table. Um, here we are again talking transaction IDs because here you do actually care about transaction IDs more than the time. Um, but we also can tell you when that unfrozen XID was assigned just so you get a sense for you know, um, kind of roughly how much um, in calendar time that is. Um, and so what you should expect, for example, on this database here is that that top table where it says indexing engine runs 35D, that table partition will get vacuumed next because it is about to reach the 400 million threshold, which is how we've tuned auto vacuum max freeze age on our own database. Um, and so you should expect that database to be vacuumed next, followed by schema table events, followed by false settings, right? So it kind of gives you the queue that, uh, that auto vacuum is working with. And at the top here, you can also see the assigned transaction IDs per minute. This will get you a sense for, you know, kind of uh, how often, like you have spikes, for example, in transaction ID assignment. And one quick note here, we won't be talking a lot about this today, but if you have multi axec IDs, um, which are usually caused by row level locking in Postgres, um, we will also tell you about multi axec ID wraparound um, or when you're approaching that. And we'll also give you the rate of assignments as well as the anti wraparound vacuums that are started for multi axec reasons. Um, the good news is most people, I think, will usually see the regular transaction ID wraparound vacuums. But if for some reason you know that you've had multi axec ID problems in the past, then you will find this very useful. And then the other thing we've added here 
um, is on each table page, you can also see that table's behavior over time, um, as well as the freezing progress. So this particular table here, again, from our own database, you can see that there is an um, entry wraparound auto vacuum every three days, right, as mentioned on the previous slide. Um, but then also you can see that each time it's running, it's essentially progressing um, those 30, 50,000, uh, sorry, 350 million um, transaction IDs that it's essentially advancing, right? It's not moving forward on. Um, if for some reason your vacuums would be blocked, um, would you know be canceled for some reason, then you would of course not see that freezing progress. Now let's talk a little bit about auto vacuum performance. So on the performance tab in Vacuum Advisor, what you can see is essentially a breakdown of the most important performance metrics. And this is a starting point. We still have a few more things we're adding, but as to start with, we talk about auto vacuum workers here. So if you have um, you know, a lot of tables to be vacuumed or a lot of databases, then you will have to do a lot of actual, you know, running a process to perform auto vacuum. Now, um, auto vacuum workers, you know, um, you can look at through PGC activity as mentioned previously. And so this essentially just looks at the last 24 hours and says, if we average out, you know, the, the number of backends with that type, how does that compare to that, you know, auto vacuum max workers, which controls how many at most you can be running? And so in our own database here, we're not close to capacity, right? We have 0 0.4 um, on average compared to the three maximum. But I have seen databases that, like with customers that we've worked with in early access for this feature that they actually, you know, are very close to like... They might have increased max workers to 12, but it's still pegged at that 12 number, right? So that even though they increased max workers, they're still kind of hitting the ceiling on how many workers they're running. And so that's really something that, you know, will require further tuning. Um, one of the things we don't do yet, but we're planning to do is also give you cost delay um, setting recommendations for situations like this. Um, so if you have 12 out of 12 running all the time, maybe not just think about auto vacuum max workers, but also think about the cost delay settings to control how fast vacuum is running because um, it gets split up by worker. So Postgres essentially says your cost limit is 1800, divide that by 12 in that particular situation. Um, and so then each you know kind of only gets a much lower um, limit because Postgres cost limits are for the whole set of auto vacuum workers, not for individual one. Um, and then there's another thing here that, you know, again, if you don't have this problem, like we do on this database, we don't have this problem. So the good news is you maybe don't have to worry about this, but if you do, then you should know about it. And so here um, we give you the skipped auto vacuums. And this requires log auto vacuum in duration as well as the log insights feature in PG Analyze to be able to get that data. Um, but if you have all of these things enabled, then we'll show you here when a regular auto vacuum was skipped because the conflicting log was um, being held on the table. So vacuum, the regular vacuum is actually very friendly in a sense, like it doesn't want to take locks that you know, the regular workload needs. Um, and so it will actually not run at all when it sees that the lock is not available. The best example that I could think of here when that happens is if, for example, you thought it's a good idea to use lock table, like the explicit lock table statement, um, because you implemented a gapless invoice sequence number, right? You're maybe in Europe, right? And so European businesses have to assign sequence numbers without gaps. And so to be able to implement that, you're doing an explicit lock table on your table when you're making these assignments of new invoice numbers. And so that will cause problems with auto vacuum um, because it can't run. And then what will happen is once it gets to that freezing scheduling point, right? So once it actually has to run a vacuum for freezing purposes, not just for bloat prevention, then Postgres will take the lock, um, but that will do a lot more work at once, um, cause a lot more IO at once for that anti wraparound vacuum. And then we also give you an insight about the multiple index phases that can happen. So quick primer in this, right? You have your auto vacuum that's running and then auto vacuum has to actually go to the indexes to clean up the like dead index entries, so to say, that point to like rows that are no longer existing in the main index. And so Postgres will only do a certain limit of that rows for which it does that. Um, and at some point it will say, well, you know, I don't have enough memory. And so I need to use multiple phases to do this. And that's really expensive because you essentially go around and you run the full index scans in the vacuum again. Right? So imagine you have five indexes. Um, if you have one index phase, it means it looks at all the five indexes once. Um, but then if you know you don't have enough kind of space in memory, um, auto vacuum will actually go around and um, run again um, to kind of get the remaining dead tuples removed from these indexes. And so this is a very clear actionable thing. If you run into this problem, increase your auto vacuum work mem or potentially also increase your auto vacuum frequency um, to kind of have less dead tuples that rows um, to be cleaned up at once. 
And so to finish, um, let's just briefly take a look at um, kind of, you know, what's coming next. And then also, again, if you have questions, please start putting them into the Q&A section. I'd be happy to get to a few of them now, and then we'll send out the rest of them later. So one of the things that we've not yet published in the initial release, but we use behind the scenes to tweak some of those insights is what we call the vacuum simulator. So to take a quick step back at PG Analyze, we really want to make sure that you understand how the recommendations work, right? So oftentimes in these, you know, smart systems, they will just give you a value and they will say, machine learning has calculated this value to be better. Um, but you don't really understand it, right? You don't really know why that particular value was chosen. Um, and so transparency is a big problem with machine learning based systems. Um, this here is not machine learning based. So we're able to actually give you the exact um, kind of logic that runs behind the scenes. And so vacuum simulator is a way for you to play with that logic yourself. So if you wanted to say, well, we're discussing in a team, how should we tune our threshold and scale factor settings, or how should we tweak our like freeze max H settings for a particular table or the whole system, then this will actually give you just a very clear visualization of how it impacts the vacuum schedule. Um, and so for example, here on the, on the first graph in the list, you can see that's the regular auto vacuum schedule. But then the second graph is, you know, if you decreased your freeze max H, you would be running the freezing anti wraparound vacuums more often Then you would see, you know, kind of how that would behave over time and how often vacuum would run. So it's just very, very helpful as you're kind of trying to reason about um, these things. And then we're also looking at a few other things. So what's not yet there in this initial release is cost limit and cost delay um, setting recommendations. Um, that's something that didn't make the cut, even though we we're close on it. Um, and really the idea here is even on new Postgres versions, even if you're in Postgres 12, which already has optimized cost limit and delay settings, even then it helps you to, in some cases, tune these to make vacuum more aggressive on very large tables. Um, so again, a pair table recommendation that we're working on. We also are looking into for the insufficient worker capacity. We're showing to, that to you right now in dashboard, but we're not yet alerting you on it or giving you notification about it. Um, and so that's one of the things we're looking at is how can we surface that more clearly to you when you are running into these backlogs. And then last, one thing we're actively looking into as well is index bloat. So earlier when we talked about bloat, we talked about table bloat. And all these estimation queries that we've now kind of built into each analyze, um, they are talking about table bloat, which is, I would say, much more reliable to estimate. Index bloat is hard to estimate correctly, and you'll often get very bad estimates, but we do think we found a method to do this better. And so our goal is to give you a way to track index bloat over time and to also then notify you when a re-index is needed. And then last, just looking ahead a little bit longer term, um, we are working on improved methods to optimize auto vacuum frequency. So generally speaking, I would say, you know, one of the most important actionable things we can give you is you should run auto vacuum more often because it reduces IO, for example. And so we've started with one insight on that, but there's more work we can do to kind of give you additional insights or more context, additional situations. We also are working on an insight to help you um, perform eager freezing in some cases. Um, there was work in Postgres that kind of stalled a bit, unfortunately, um, to implement that directly in Postgres, um, but there are ways to approximate that um, by using the vacuum min freeze age setting um, on particular tables to essentially freeze more early so that you have less IO impact over time. And then last, one thing we're still in, you know, the sketch phases, I would say, um, we are looking into automating some of those things for you if you want to, right? So again, you're in control, but sometimes it does get a bit tedious with a lot of per table tuning. Um, and so one of the things we're looking at is having some automation features directly in PG Analyze um, with, you know, an approval workflow. So you can say, apply the settings instead of you having to log into the database, you can actually have PG Analyze control that for you again, if you want um, to run these per table changes on your behalf. Um, and you'll hear more about that probably next year. Um, we're still working on some of that, but if you are interested in you know, how this might work in the future or you have a use case, um, please do let us know. Um, we always like talking to customers early um, and kind of understanding you know, your, your use cases, your workflows today. And that's really it. Um, I really appreciate everyone's time here. Um, we'll get to the Q&A. Um, if you have additional questions, please post them in the Q&A section now. Um, and then again, we'll email you a recording of the webinar as well. Um, if you are interested in what we're up to PG Analyze more generally, um, feel free to check out our newsletter or our resources. Um, you can also find the um, other auto vacuum that we've done in the resources section on the website. And so now um, let me take a look at those questions. All right, um, so let's see, I'll start with, um, Krishna had a question, do I need to upgrade the collector to get the vacuum stats to appear in PG Analyze? And it really depends on what your collector version is. Um, if I recall correctly from memory, it is 50.1, which you should be running, which is the last release. Um, 
you may also, if you're running a slightly older release, you'll get some of the data, um, but we did do a few bug fixes um, very, you know, kind of as we're testing. Um, and so I would recommend essentially just upgrading your collector package or redeploying the PGNLS container. The um, other question was, how do we determine a, a replication slot by Shane? Um, so, uh, sorry, how do we determine a stale replication slot? Um, so stale replication slots um, kind of, as mentioned, are really when your replication slot is um, not advancing or progressing. Um, and oftentimes, you know, there is no active kind of user of it, right? Um, so Postgres, for example, for logical replication, um, you can see when a slot is existing, but not active because there's no um, subscriber connected to it. Um, but what we're looking at for the X-Men Horizon data is really the individual catalog X-Men and the X-Men of that replication slot to understand is the X-Men not advancing, right? Is that particular value that blocks auto vacuum not advancing? And so we'll give you that as the kind of um, calendar time-based alert. And then let me see. All right, and Sixtus had a question. If auto vacuum doesn't clean up at that tuple in a table because it's still being used in a transaction, if auto vacuum tries again and again, won't it clean up that that tuple once the transaction has ended? And that is correct, right? So generally speaking, you know, you would expect if all transactions have ended that you know you can clean up that tuples. But the thing again that's not obvious about this behavior in Postgres is that it is not the transaction that was modifying the tuple, right? Which you would think like if once that has ended, you know it's done. But it's any transaction that was running at the time that a modification was essentially like completed. And so really you need to essentially every transaction that was running at the time when that delete, for example, happened needs to have finished in order for the auto vacuum uh, process to clean things up. Um, so it's it's a lot longer essentially in um, transaction ID time. Um, and it really is a function of any transaction that's running in a system. And then um, let me see, Krishna had a second question. Um, does PGNLS treat replicas differently than a primary? And would vacuum stats be specific to these instance physically when they're physical databases um, or different databases? Um, that's a great question. So um, right, the question is, how do I think about this in the context of readers and writers or primaries and replicas? And the answer is, you don't think about this on a physical replica because it will just get the physical structure, right? So if you go to Vacuum Advisor on a replica, um, we'll actually tell you um, that you know you are on a replica. <laughs> and so it's not actually gonna give you um, any recommendations because really it is a function of what you do on a primary that then goes to the replica. Um, the one exception to this is when you run read queries on a replica that will actually cause potential problems again with that X-Men Horizon. Um, and that will be alerted on, on the primary because the primary sees that um, information. Let's see. So Daniel had a question. If I want to update 1 billion, I guess, rows of data, um, what is the best strategy to avoid auto vacuum running continuously? So if you update a billion rows, um, it's a good question. Um, it does depend a bit on the physicality of those rows, right? So if it's a lot of small data points, um, it's different than a lot of big data points, but a billion is a lot. Um, I would say um, if the worry is that auto vacuum is running too much and you're okay with taking a hit you know, one at a time, you could actually at least temporarily increase your um, threshold setting, right? So to, again, the two settings that control this is the scale factor and the threshold. Um, and so if you raise, um, for example, the threshold to a billion, I mean, it doesn't seem like a good idea, but you could do it temporarily to kind of not have auto vacuum run um, all the time as you're updating the data. Um, but do be aware that if you also have other activity at, on that same table, right? So for example, if there's inserts, um, really those updates or even the updates themselves do, do need space, right? And so each update will produce a dead row version and a new row version. And so in a sense, you do actually want your auto vacuum to be running um, so that you don't have kind of a lot of bloat in the table. Um, but if your aim is to really not have auto vacuum run, um, the threshold settings are usually the, the control. All right, and then let me see. So we're all asked the question, can this potentially substitute full vacuum in a 24 seven production world? So I imagine um, full vacuum means vacuum full, although I'm not 100% sure. Um, I would say for, for production databases, really the way to think about vacuum is it's good for more smaller vacuums to run rather than one big vacuum, right? And so one of the things we're trying to do with the bloat estimation um, and the bloat um, kind of like scheduling as a recommendation um, is to run auto vacuum more often so that you have less work to do at one time. And so um, 
you will, you know, if you think of vacuum full as an actual vacuum full um, kind of statement, that does require a very expensive lock, right? And so, of course, you know, our goal with, you know, running vacuum early enough is to prevent that um, by avoiding the bloat uh, from happening in the first place. Um, but, you know, it's it's essentially, it's, it's very specific to your database. But if you have a particular situation, always happy to kind of talk through it in detail. And then um, one last question by Ahmed was, um, should the auto vacuum average read and write speeds be consistent? And if they're not consistent, what does that mean? So auto vacuum read write right guess for example um, you can see that in your log output. Um, and so they are a function of the cost delay settings in auto vacuum. Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a big problem if they're not consistent because again cost delay and limit get split up by the individual workers. Um, and so they you know they can sometimes be less and more. Sometimes you know there's also more pages that are in memory and so it doesn't actually have to go to disk as much. And so I don't think it's a problem if they're not consistent, but I would look at it over time for particular tables um, and then get a sense for is it worth actually you know kind of raising your cost limit um, to have a higher read speed or higher write speed. Um, perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, again, if you're interested in a personal demo and talk through um, how Vacuum Advisor works, um, you've got a quick survey at the end. Um, and I'm really excited to share this with you. Um, looking forward to catch you at the next PGLS webinar. Thank you.